In the mid to late 90s, Capcom was knocking it out of the park with their new survival horror hit of the series. Resident Evil 1, 2, and 3 were excellent sellers, each selling at least 3.5 million copies on the PlayStation alone, all placing in the top 25 best-selling PlayStation games of all time. And that's not even including the ports to the Sega Saturn and Dreamcast, PC, Nintendo 64, and eventually the GameCube. And of course, the Game.com version of RE2. I promise I'll stop mentioning that thing, but now is not the time. Look at how much this thing is going for. Anyway, I mentioned last time how the development for Resident Evil 3 was a bit rocky, with Shinji Mikami temporarily quitting due to executive meddling, but pulling a George Costanza slash Larry David and showing up to work the next day. I thought you quit. <laughs> what <to> quit? <laughs> Who quit? <laughs> Original plans were scrapped or had to be shifted, and a lot of this was due to the recent announcement by Sony for the PlayStation 2. But because Resident Evil 2 was such a success, Capcom had plans to work on some side projects alongside Resident Evil 3's development. And well, it's about time we check out the first side project to get an official release. Capcom was flying high, so surely this one couldn't miss either. So the first thing to note right off the bat is that Resident Evil 1, 2, and 3 were all solely developed by Capcom. Each game had a different director at the helm, but Shinji Mikami was involved with all three as well. But now it was time to dial things back a bit and let a different developer get involved. Enter Japanese development company Tos, who had a ton of experience developing games for Nintendo systems, like Yoshi's Cookie, Game & Watch Gallery games, a bunch of sports games, and also a bunch of Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z games for the Famicom and Super Famicom. But in the late 90s, they also started to make some games for Sony's PlayStation, like an aquarium simulator called Theme Aquarium, and a Shin Megami Tensei game called Devil Summoner Soul Hackers. So they were now tasked with creating the first spin-off game for the Biohazard slash Resident Evil series, with assistance from one of the Capcom production studios. There really isn't a ton to say about the development from this game. What the main goal was here was to create a game in the Resident Evil universe that would utilize a light gun controller. A light gun controller is a controller meant to resemble how you would use a gun, where you point it at the screen and can aim it around to shoot at the precise spot that it's pointing at. I won't go into exactly how they work, but they utilize a light sensor. There were a ton of arcade games that had this, as you could probably walk into any arcade and would see at least one game with those light gun controller docks. For home consoles, they became pretty popular in the mid-80s with the release of Duck Hunt on the NES, as it was typically paired with Super Mario Bros. But I think easily the most notable series that existed to help lead to the development for this game is Sega's House of the Dead series. The first House of the Dead game came out the same year as Resident Evil did, in fact, in 1996. It is played in the first person, and you, of course, utilize a light gun controller to take down hordes of zombies. So I mean, it seemed like an obvious decision that Capcom would want Resident Evil to make their way into that market as well. At this point, House of the Dead 1 and 2 were both out, and they were pretty popular in the arcade scene. Even to this day, you can likely find a House of the Dead game in an arcade if it's big enough. I think it's a requirement at Dave & Buster's, but don't quote me on that. House of the Dead games also made their way to consoles as well. So development went into production with director Hiroyuki Kai having the job. According to the Resident Evil wiki and IMDb, this is the only game he ever worked on. However, the story for this next game was written by Naoyuki Sakai, an Ari veteran Noburu Sugimura, the man responsible for the restarted development and story changes to Resident Evil 2, including the creation of Claire Redfield. The original name for this spin-off game was all set to be Biohazard Gun Survivor Behind the Mask, but the Behind the Mask subtitle was eventually dropped. So, just weeks into the turn of the century, Biohazard Gun Survivor was released in Japan on January 27, 2000 for the PlayStation. The hyped PlayStation 2 was still a little over a month away from its release, so this is actually the final Resident Evil game on the original PlayStation. It then got its European release on March 31, 2000 with the name Resident Evil Survivor, but the North American release found its way into a very well-known delay, which is what gives this game a bit of notoriety. On April 20th, 1999, a high school in Columbine, Colorado experienced a horrible, horrible shooting tragedy. 
As you can understand, I can't and don't really want to delve into this further for risk of it affecting my channel, but if you were alive in the US in 1999, you were well aware of this. It was horrendous and was all over the news. But this event was what put Resident Evil Survivor's North American release into a bit of a delay. It eventually got its release on August 30th, 2000, seven months after the Japanese release, but they chose to remove all light gun support. Guns were, and still are, a very hot button topic, so the decision was made to not have this North American release utilize light guns. Instead, only the PlayStation controller would work. As you can expect, it did not improve the controls of this game in any way, which we'll get into soon. But per usual, let's check out the cover and manual for the game and see what we did get. So interestingly enough, all three regional covers are very different from each other. The cover for Biohazard Gun Survivor in Japan features a silhouette of an unknown man in a stance aiming a gun. There is something in the background that kind of resembles a gas mask or night vision goggles or something, but it isn't obvious. What also isn't obvious is that this is a game in the Biohazard series. If you remove the title, you would have absolutely no clue that this was a Biohazard game. Maybe I'm biased, but come on, I would guess this was part of the James Bond series. That's 007 right there. This was in the World Is Not Enough era, so yeah, I'm convinced. And this seems like the time to plug my video for all of those World Is Not Enough games, so go check out that next for no reason other than I decided to bring it up just now. The European cover for Resident Evil Survivor is just a gun laying on its side next to some bullets with a shaded red and black background. Yeah, that's it. Just a gun and some bullets. That would be like the cover for a Zelda game being just a picture of a sword and shield and... Oh, right. Well, I still don't love this one. But this time, I think the North American cover is actually the best of the three, although it still doesn't reveal too much. It shows a brown-haired man in a green jacket next to a scary monster with giant teeth in the back. At least the image of the creature can help remind you that, yes, this is a Resident Evil game. I don't normally like to mention future games in these videos because I want to try and keep it within the times, but I can't help but think this looks like a regenerator from RE4. But, okay, back to 2000. Who this man is, though, I guess it could be Chris Redfield if you were wagering a guess? I don't know, on to the manual. While Umbrella's mutant T-Virus wreaks havoc in Raccoon City, unknown to the rest of the world, another city faces a similar fate. Fleeing the chaos, a solitary helicopter crash lands, adding to the confusion. A lone survivor, name drop, crawls out and desperately tries to escape the burning wreckage. The chopper explodes. The man is knocked unconscious. It is night when he comes to his senses. How much time has passed? He hears echoing voices of crying and moaning all around him. His mind in a haze, he starts to walk. He finds himself in a deserted back street. Why am I here? My head aches. I don't want to believe it, but it seems I have lost my memory. The past is blocked in darkness. When I try to remember it, it slips away like fog. Is this a battlefield? No. It is just an old town, but something is wrong. I sense something really dangerous in this town. I have to get out of here. I may be meeting someone later on. Is he an enemy or a friend? Am I doing right or wrong? Am I good or bad? Am I really human? I don't know anything. I'm only sure of one thing. All I can rely on is this gun. This gun will guide me. It is my only protection. I will survive. Okay, so it's seeming less likely that the man on the cover is Chris Redfield. In fact, we aren't even meant to know who he is because not even he knows. There's a helicopter crash and this is not actually in Raccoon City. That's about all we got. Because of this, there's no character description to go over, so the rest of the manual just explains controls, and there's some brief images of other people and the creature on the cover, and... Oh, hey, a tyrant. Nice. Okay, time for the game. Resident Evil Survivor In 1998, 
a disaster struck the quiet Midwestern residents of Raccoon City. An uncontrollable outbreak of the umbrella-created T-Virus transformed the city into an inescapable death trap. To stop the outbreak from spreading, Umbrella Incorporated was forced to wipe out the entire city. Wait, 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 pause, pause. Okay, two things real quick. First of all, that is both the best and worst Resident Evil I've ever heard. Resident Evil Survivor. Makes me laugh every time. And in this game's honor, I'll refer to it as Resident Evil for the duration of the video. Secondly, this intro thing here is making it out to be like this spin-off game picks up after the events of Resident Evil 3. So, uh, some quick spoilers, I guess, for the end of that game if you are one of the few who don't want to know what happens. But Umbrella decides that they have had enough of Raccoon City being a thing, and they sent a missile to absolutely explode it from existence. In a race to escape the city, Jill finally shows Nemesis what stars are and kills it for good. Yeah, Nemesis mutated quite a bit. A helicopter swoops in to save Jill and Carlos just in time, being flown by the man himself, Barry Burton. Oh yes, he's alive. Raccoon City does get absolutely exploded from existence as Jill does her best Leon impression and says that Umbrella is going down. That's it. Umbrella's going down. As credits roll. So now, back to Resident Evil Survivor, taking place after this happens. However, this was not the only location where an outbreak occurred. Well, that was something that happens. We see a truck on fire near some zombies, a man dressed in white hanging on the side of a helicopter before falling off, the helicopter crashes and some other guy is thrown from the wreckage like Jill at the beginning of RE3, and now you control him. Where... where am I? Oh! I... I don't remember anything. Who am I? He doesn't know who he is or where he is. But aside from all of that, the first thing you probably notice is how rough this game looks. I mean, yikes. All part of that PlayStation charm, I guess, but you would never know that this came out after RE2 and 3. The next thing you'll notice as the gameplay starts is that for the first time ever, it's no longer played in the third person with the fixed security camera style angles. Yeah, this is a first person shooter. This certainly makes sense if you knew that this was made for use with the light gun, but if you didn't know this, if you were playing the North American version for example, it might be kind of a surprise. You now have a HUD screen showing your equipped weapon in the bottom left, how much ammo you have in the middle, and your familiar ECG health condition in the bottom right. Now it feels like a Resident Evil game. Also, we get the door opening load screen too, of course. Going through the door, we see the man in white that fell from the helicopter, now unconscious on the ground. 
The man you're playing as says he looks familiar but can't remember, and notices that he's holding dog tags with the name Ark Thompson on it. All of a sudden, you get attacked by a zombie from behind, so you can now get used to the controls, whether you're using the Namco GunCon or the standard PlayStation controller. You move your character with the D-pad or analog stick, and then if you hold R1, then the D-pad or stick controls the aiming reticle. As you can guess, this can be a bit awkward. Moving the reticle feels pretty janky, and if you've played this game, you'll know what I mean. It functions, but it still feels off. Another thing you may notice here is that the ammo for your handgun is now infinite. A very different approach from the original game where you had to keep track of every bullet you had. But the idea here is for this game to have more of an arcade feel to it, more so than inventory management. Another thing to give this game an arcade feel is that obtainable items are now very clearly shown on the screen as they slightly hover and rotate in place. They aren't really meant to give the feel that they are part of the environment anymore. So you continue on through a restaurant littered with zombies until you reach a ringing payphone. When you go to answer it, the phone hang up. Ah, too bad. But going down the stairs... Oh no! Liquors! Well that's kinda cool, you get to see them again I guess. Ah well, see you guys. In the next area, another payphone rings. This time, a voice says... Vincent. Who is this? Vincent? Who's that? Wait... Am I Vincent? Vincent, you are a murderer. A murderer! A murderer? What are you talking about? Answer me! Who did I kill? And thus the game continues on here. It's up to you to piece together who you are, where you are, who Ark Thompson is, and why someone is calling you on a payphone calling you Vincent the Murderer. So you should have a pretty good idea now if this game is for you or not. As for some positives, you know, I actually kind of think it's a pretty cool setup just being thrown right into the game. You don't know who you are or what is even going on just like your character, so that can actually help with some immersion. Amnesia plots can be a bit of an overused trope, but I think it can work for a video game more so than a TV show or movie. You're just as confused as he is, so you can figure out the plot together. Also, they did try to do something different here with the first person view, so I give them some points for ambition. They broke away from the third person tank controls for an experiment here. It's just, well, people who bought this game in North America were simply not able to play the game as intended. Whether you agree with that decision or not, it was just unfortunate timing, and this is what we got. In that sense, you kinda wonder why they bothered to release the game in North America at all if you couldn't play it the intended way. Because using the PlayStation controller really isn't great. But controls aside, this game really just looks rough. It's so pixelated to the point where you almost have to use your imagination to see what something even is. What the other games excelled at were the use of pre-rendered backgrounds that the characters move around on. They looked great for the time and really added a sense of realism. But since this is in the first person, it's very difficult for the PlayStation to handle that. With that said, some people truly love the jankiness of the graphics, and I can respect that too. Realism doesn't always equal better. As for me though, I kinda hate the look of this game. I'll take the janky graphics of the first game any day over this one, and that game was four years before this. Also, this game is extremely short. Just checking how long to beat, it can be completed in about two hours, with four hours needed to 100% it. But also, a game's length really only matters to certain people. That could be a huge deterrent for some people, while others may be drawn to the very short arcade-like experience here. Two hours would actually be a really long time to be in one place if you were playing this in an arcade. This is not meant to be like RE1, 2, or 3, and you should know that ahead of time. But another positive for me personally is the return of the terrible voice acting here, hearkening back to the days of RE1. The voice acting in RE2 specifically was a huge quality improvement, as was 3, but I still find some of the deliveries in that game to be pretty comical too. No! I'm not going anywhere! I'd rather starve to death in here than be eaten by one of those undead monsters! Now leave me alone! But man, we are back to the bad, campy line deliveries here, and I am all for it. What? Vincent? 
It's me, your mother. My mother? Vincent, please, listen to your mother. I want you to leave Umbrella. I want you to stop performing those terrible crimes and just come back home. Without giving anything away, there are some children you encounter later. They're just the worst. I love it. Your brother? Leave her alone! Lily, run, go! Lot! Put that down. I won't harm you. I promise. Liar. You'll kill me if I drop it. I'm not stupid. Now stay back! Don't come any closer! It may not be the most fun game to actually play, but I am capable of looking back on some of this pretty fondly. I first played it maybe 10 years ago or so, so I experienced it much later than its release. It kicked off the millennium for Resident Evil, it had some controversy surrounding it, and was the conclusion for the PlayStation era. It does have a level of memorability, for better or for worse. Because reception-wise, yeah, no. It got pretty low grades across the board, which is a first for this series. It has long load times, feels like a cheap cash grab, and has an uncanny lack of fun. It sold quite poorly in comparison to the other three games at not even half a million copies. This could be for so many reasons, but it really was the first misstep for the series. People just didn't really want this. However, it actually did spawn off three sequels to complete the Gun Quadrilogy, believe it or not. And to make things even weirder, only three out of the four games are actually Resident Evil games. Those will be discussed at a later date. But this actually remained as a PlayStation exclusive, no other ports at all. All except for September of 2002 when it was ported to the PC, but only in China and Taiwan. Yeah, everything about this game is intriguingly strange. But next time, we're actually kinda going back in time, just slightly. As I said at the end of the RE3 video, the Japanese version of Gun Survivor was the actual next release. But going back to February of 2000, we actually got another spin-off title. However, unlike Survivor, this next game is actually canon to the overall story, so it is a major release. Join me next time as we give a look at Resident Evil Code Veronica. Paraspector will return. Mark Thompson, huh? Though I can't remember anything, I know that this was no way for anyone to die. <laughs> I won't allow you to escape. You're going to pay for what you've done. <laughs> Helicopter? No. The cleaners have already arrived? Cleaners? What do you mean? Who are you? What are you talking about, Vincent? What did you call me? Uh, What's that? Uh, what? What the? Die, Vincent! Die! No. This is me. It was all my fault. <laughs> so this is where the city is controlled from. Oh! Oh! What's happening to me? Hello? Can you hear me? Who are you? Wh what are you doing? Answer me! What is the tape you're listening to? I, I don't know. I was only listening to it because I'm so bored. I know you think that I'm a murderer, but you're wrong. I would never do anything like that. He said he's going to the factory by the ropeway. Factory? But there are tons and tons of scary monsters there. I may have been a bad person, but that was before. That's not who I am now. Ah! Lot? Ah! What? A spy. Hmm. Thank you. You are a good boy, Lot. Okay, we'll use that. Let's go get Lily. The self-destruction system has been activated. What are we gonna do, mister? Yeah, what are we gonna do? Umbrella is going to take care of me. No! Who? I can't believe you.
you're not dead yet. Whatever. That's right. At the request of my friend, Leon S. Kennedy, I remember. I remember everything. <laughs>